Revelation chapter number two, and then we'll be, uh, th- this is based off the school of Christ and uh, a guy by the name of Reverend B.H. Clendenin. And um, I, this, his stuff, his, this, this school of Christ has blessed me over my young ministry. And so we're going to follow it a little bit. And uh, so Revelation chapter number two, and just for the sake of time today, just to make sure I can get through this in a reasonable amount of time, I, I am going to read today, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe later on here, uh, we'll, if things are going well, we'll, we'll go back to more of a Sunday school uh, question and answer and, and uh, reading format. But Revelation chapter number two and verse number one. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless... I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Pardon me. But this hast thou, this thou hast, that thou... Hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These things saith the first to the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee A crown of life. I want you to notice what he just told the last church too. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. And then here on this church, I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write. These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that received it. And the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel 
which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Skip over to chapter 3 and verse number 1. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Amen. In the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, we have the Lord's survey of the seven churches. And his eyes has a flame of fire, are looking into the inner spiritual state of these seven churches. Is he not? Drilling in there. And when all the facts that he sees about these churches have been surveyed and gathered together, it is to establish one fact about these churches. And it is, it is to establish the presence of or the absence of life. Amen. He's looking for life. In the church. From the Lord's standpoint. There's only one thing. That justifies his. Keeping anything. That claims to represent him. There's only one thing. That justifies. Christ continuing with a church. And that is life. The issue for each and every one of these churches. Was whether they could continue to be a witness. Or whether he would have to remove their lampstand. Is that not correct? Amen. Is whether they continue to be a witness or whether he'll remove their lampstand from out of its place. Which meant they could not continue in a relationship with Christ. So the great question is one of either, of, uh, of either continuing in a relation with God. Amen. For God's purpose. Or whether they would pass out of God's purpose. The question concerning every church raised up by God in relation to his purpose is what justifies God maintaining that vessel, that church, that person, that individual? Amen. And so we find this is this hot, the heading on this here section is the conflict. The conflict. Amen. The conflict between death and life. And uh, so this lesson today is called the testimony of life. The testimony of life. What justifies God in maintaining this church? Amen. What justifies God in continuing in a relationship with you and I and with his church? It is evidence that there are things which disqualify some from fellowship with God. In our reading this morning, and there are some churches that are doing a lot of good, aren't they? There's a lot of good things, a lot of outreach, a lot of doctrinal, there's a lot of things that are good, but there are some things that disqualify them from having fellowship with God. Amen. In the first place, the fact that God raised up a church, raised up an individual, raised up a vessel for him to use does not is not enough to justify God continuing to keep and use that vessel, right? From what we read this morning. Amen. So again, the fact that an instrument was greatly used of God that he raised up does not justify God in preserving that instrument. The fact that such a church has a wonderful history of devotion to God and at some time had been a real, genuine expression of God's love and grace is not enough to justify God continuing with that church. I've had conversations with different folks about different ways that people do outreach. And, um, you know, different churches... um, one particular story that I, I that I actually use and tell people a lot is um, is where a, a one church had had uh, uh, um, I guess some of the people in the church had begun to press the pastor 
to, um, to do a certain type of thing that they wanted to do. And they wanted to call it beer and the Bible. And with their beer and the Bible, it was going to be a Bible study. And so they were going to, they wanted to offer free beer to anybody who would come and sit and listen and uh, participate in a Bible study. This is just, a, the, from my knowledge, I may get some of the story wrong, but this is the way they do it. So finally that pastor gave in. And he said, but I don't want anything to do with it. You guys handle it. So they did. And supposedly, this allegedly, there they started getting a lot of people coming. Uh, because, you know, you can probably get a lot of people to come if you offer free beer. But uh, anyway, they come. And uh, allegedly, they were getting saved and giving up their alcohol. And continuing in the Bible study. Now, to me, I highly, highly doubt that. Not necessarily because God can't use certain things to save people. I, I know a man that was saved in the middle of a Van Halen rock concert. God saved him on the spot. Amen. He heard uh, there, was, there was a statement made by a uh, in the, by uh, the lead singer. I, um, uh, I forget what his name is, but uh, um, uh, the, anyway. I, I can't remember. I think it's Lee something or another. But um, anyway, he he made a statement in the middle of the concert saying, not even God can save your soul at a Van Halen concert. And that struck that young man and he prayed for salvation right there and God saved him. So I'm not saying God can't use certain things and certain atmospheres to save people. What I have a problem with is, a, is attaching something hey, that reeks of death not just regular death, physical death, but spiritual death. Uh, hey man, we're in there's a lot of excess of sin. Hey man, that wrecks a lot of homes. Attaching something that is dead to that which we claim is living. That's the problem that I have. So what justifies God? Maybe God did use that. Maybe he did. Uh, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, ruin my, my name by saying he did. Uh, I don't believe he did. I don't know that he did. I have no idea. Amen. But in this sense, uh, amen, I don't believe God will continue very long with the people, amen, that are attaching that which is dead to that which is supposed to be alive. Come here, Brent. Sit up here. Come here. Come here. I better keep rolling here. To answer the question, we must look to see what God's purpose was in bringing the instrument uh, of God, the vessel of God, into being. Uh, we will find all we need from the description of what God is referring to as a vessel here in our text this morning. What this lampstand, he's talking about these lampstands. Shall I have to remove your, your light? I have to remove your lamp from out of the midst of this. And so we look, we look in the Old Testament, we find, uh, you know, uh, different descriptions that match this, uh, you know, this lamp, lampstand here in Revelation 2. One in particular in Zechariah chapter 4. And in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 4, we find a lampstand with seven bowls. And seven pipes. And, uh, and, 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 but the, the, the amazing thing about the lampstand or the candlestick that is found in Zechariah chapter 4 is that it, the, they're not filling the, the lamp or the vessel from, from oil out of a pitcher or a pot. Um, but they are, but the, the lampstand itself is hooked directly up to a living olive tree. All right. A lampstand. This lampstand is hooked up to a... is literally the bowls that hold the oil in this lampstand are hooked directly up to a living olive tree in which out of those olive trees comes a continuous flow of oil into the lampstand. It's, uh, it's the, the point being, the main point being I want to make this morning is that the oil comes from that which is living. It's not 